Okay, um, so what we're going to uh, have a look at is, uh, is just this algorithm in its simplest form uh, implemented for this molecule, BE2, in this basis set. You don't have to worry about it. The only thing that's relevant is that the Hilbert space is about 346,000 determinants, 346,485 determinants to be exact. And um, so that is a non-trivial problem. You can exactly diagonalize it. And in blue uh, is the exact ground state eigenvector for this problem. So along this axis here, is some discretization, is the discretization, so there are, in fact, 346,485 impulses on this plot. The vast majority is so small that they appear as zero, but they're actually not zero. If you look at the CI vector, there's plenty of 10 to the minus 8s, 10 to the minus 10s, 10 to the minus 12s, and so on. But the ones that are not substantially non-zero, you can see in blue, this one out here, at an amplitude of minus 0.8 and a bit is the Hartree-Fock uh, determinant. And then you have these ones out here and uh, these ones out here. And the main point is that I really don't care where these, what these guys are, where they are, or any such thing. And that's one of the nice things about... Uh, so we don't... So I want to start off with minimal information regarding, uh, regarding the, 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 the ground state solution. So what we're going to do is to start one walker, that's in red, on the Hartree-Fock determinant, and uh, then just uh, execute uh, the algorithm. So let's see what happens. Uh, as we Let's just concentrate on this top plot as this simulation proceeds. So the red now is our instantaneous distribution of walkers. And as time goes on, uh, and this is the number of iterations uh, on, on here. So what you begin to see is the distribution in red actually settles down on the original exact eigenvector. And in particular, you can see the signal that's growing on the Hartree-Fock determinant. And that indicates more and more and more walkers are actually condensing onto it. And that's actually what you want. So if we, I'll just rerun the simulation from, from the start again. Um, now, on this plot, we see the, the energy. And you can see the projected energy shown in green is fluctuating all over the place. And uh, at some point, it begins to settle down. And actually, that point, if I just go back, uh, if we just watch it, you begin to look for a red signal which you begin to see you begin to see it about now you see that red signal is growing here that is when the uh, the projected energy begins to, to dampen down these wild oscillations and you can see it settles down on the red line here which is the exact solution to the problem so that's what I was mentioning before is that until you end up with a with a large number of walkers on your reference determinant, your projected energy is showing very large fluctuations. And in fact, if the sign on the reference determinant is oscillating, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, you even go through, essentially, you get these singularities there. They're completely meaningless. Okay? But once you get enough walkers on your reference determinant, uh, uh, then you get this nice signal emerging. And uh, the energy essentially settles down on the exact solution. Now, what's shown in blue is the shift, uh, which initially is held zero. So in this phase of this simulation, we're not trying to control the population of walkers. In fact, the population shows a very interesting dynamics. Um, what happens, is that's shown down here, is first of all, the population grows. And then, despite the fact that we're not controlling the population, the population stabilizes. Here it goes. It's completely flat. And then it begins to grow again. Okay. 
Now, this feature of it going flat, uh, is we call this the annihilation plateau. That's actually the point at which you have enough walkers that they start bumping into each other and start annihilating each other. And at that point, the wave function actually properly emerges. And as it comes out of this uh, plateau phase, you get another exponential rise, but it's, uh, although it's not obvious in this plot, it's a lot slower than this. Now, when I hit the target number of walkers, which in this case was set at 2 million, uh, I can, uh, which was just the input, we'll vary it in a second, um, I, can, uh, I now vary the shift in order to control the population at 2 million, and the shift now relaxes and uh, oscillates about the uh, about the exact energy. So I have two measures of the energy, in other words. I have one coming from the population control, and I have one coming from the projected energy. And if those two don't agree with each other, then we know that uh, we don't have uh, uh, the exact solution for the problem. Now, what's shown here in this plot is the amount of annihilation that's actually going on in this, uh, in this uh, uh, eigenvector. And the interesting thing to see is that these regions where the exact solution is, uh, is sparse, uh, is the, that sparsity arises to a large extent because of annihilation. In other words, you get positive and negative walkers being spawned onto those determinants, but they're being spawned at roughly the same rate. So they annihilate each other and nothing is left. And that's what makes these fermionic eigenvectors so difficult to intuit. Okay, so many of these determinants out here are very strongly coupled to the, ex to the important ones. But they're just unimportant in the final solution because of, uh, because of annihilation. Okay, so now let me, uh, so this is, the, that was the beryllium uh, dimer. Here's another example with a water molecule this is now a much bigger Hilbert space, 452 million determinants. This is, again, uh, exactly diagonalizable, but now with considerable effort. And here, you see, we start our simulation off with, I think, with one walker, and it grows very rapidly, in this case, to 26 million walkers. When it hits 26 million walkers, once again, the simulation goes into a, this annihilation plateau. The growth just automatically attenuates for a, quite a long period of time. You can see maybe 15, 20,000 iterations. And then, once again, it starts to uh, come out of this, uh, 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 the annihilation plateau. But this rate of exponential growth is now uh, what I call coherent exponential growth. It's a lot slower than the initial growth phase that was essentially incoherent exponential growth, where you were just spawning walkers, uh, but they weren't annihilating each other. Um, you can see in, in the dotted line is the amount of annihilation that's going on. You see initially, until you hit the plateau, there is not much annihilation. And then you get to a critical amount of annihilation and once you get to that critical amount of, un, uh, of annihilation, when you combine it with the, uh, with the normal death rate, so you see this is the death rate, this is the annihilation rate, and that's the birth rate. And if you add these two together, you get exactly that, and you, you end up with, uh, with no growth uh, whatsoever. So in this case, the annihilation plateau is at 26 million walkers, and then it grow, and then, so here I think we'd set our target number of walkers to be about 50 million or so or 40 million, which is about one-tenth of the uh, total Hilbert space. So what we have is an interesting result, is that the amount of storage I need to get the exact solution is about one-tenth of the original Hilbert space, which is actually quite an interest. I mean, if I say that to a numerical analyst, they will say, well, how can you possibly do that? And that is uh, what, what the Monte Carlo method is, uh, is, is the sampling technique is uh, buying us. So, so I was actually very you know, excited when we first thought of this algorithm because we had this nice population dynamics that could give us the ground state solution of these huge, uh, of these huge uh, Hilbert spaces. And uh, so the question was, well, what's the snag? 
And the snag is that the annihilation plateau, the number of walkers that you need to hit before you can extract anything meaningful, unfortunately scales with the original Hilbert space. The prefactor will be different from one system to, a, to another. So, for example, this is actually a selection, this is more or less all known exact results in, in molecular quantum chemistry. And uh, so we looked at all of them. We'll actually just do this one in a second uh, uh, as an online demonstration. Is the neon atom. Here you have a plateau, uh, six point, uh, Hilbert space of 6.6, 6.7 million determinants. And the number of walkers that we need to get to the plateau is 210,000. So if you like, the fraction of the space that you need to instantaneously occupy with walkers is about 3% of the space. If you now deal with the, the, um, the carbon dimer uh, in this basis set, that has a Hilbert space of about 27, 28 million determinants. And that needed 15 million walkers before you could hit the plateau. If I terminated my simulation or if I went into variable shift mode before I hit that 15 million, then I get nonsense out of the simulation. Why do I get nonsense? It's because I haven't condensed enough walkers on the, uh, on the Hartree-Fock determinant to, to be able to get a signal. And so that means that I needed to occupy about 54% of the space before I could converge, and so on. Uh, nitrogen molecule, typically for these molecular systems, you need about 50 to 40, 50, 60% of the space instantaneously occupied by walkers before you can get to this uh, plateau. But nevertheless, you know, we were still able to get some, uh, some systems that would be more or less beyond uh, exact diagonalization. For example, the oxygen molecule or the CO molecule, these were Hilbert spaces that were now really very big. This, in this case, is about 5.4 billion determinants. And for the oxygen molecule, we needed about 2.6 billion walkers before we could, uh, before we could get to the uh, plateau. Okay. So the big question uh, was how, maybe I should do a demonstration at this stage. It's kind of interesting. Uh, I will just log on to my uh, So let's, just, just to give you an idea of timings and things, um, let's look at the neon atom. And um, just, so I have two files here, uh, FCI dump, this is just a symbolic link to it, which is uh, the file that my Hartree Fock solver has provided me that is this list of integrals in it. So if you look at it, um, you have some header information. So this is a problem with 23 spatial orbitals, so 46 spin orbitals, and 10 electrons. There's some information about the symmetry. And there is a long list here of these four index integrals. So 1, 1, 1, 1 refers to the four index integral, you know, spatial orbital 1 for electron 1, spatial orbital 1 for electron 2, and so on. And uh, these are the, uh, these are the uh, integral. So this is a file which I'm going to assume is the input to, uh, to, uh, to, our, to our calculation. So if you've got a molecule and you, want to, and you want to say, okay, I want to do an FCIQMC calculation on it, then the first thing you need to do is to take MolPro, for example, uh, run, run it, get the Hartree-Fock orbitals, and get this file out of, out of MolPro, which is possible to do. And now we want to run our calculation. So there is a second input file which specifies the input parameters. And, um, and the only thing that's gonna, that we're going to be concerned about here is the total number of walkers that I will set to 500,000. 
Now, I'm setting it to 500,000 because I know in this problem the plateau is actually at about 200,000 or so. so. But this is just for, as a demonstration uh, of what's going to go on. And so now let's just start, start the calculation, and I'm going to start it with one walker on the Hartree Fock. Okay. So we will run, so this is a quad core, so we will run it uh, on, um, on, on, on the four, four processes that we have. So, yeah, so now we've uh, launched a, a four-processor job. Our, our code is called NISI, uh, stands for N-Electron CI. It was the original uh, CI code that I started developing. And, um, okay, so let's now have a look. I hope I can get... The first thing that we're going to look at is the number of walkers, ah, that's good. which started off at one, and just in the few seconds that we've been talking, it's got to, uh, actually, let me just have a look. I may be running this in initiator mode. Yes, I think I am. I'm going to stop this job and uh, rerun it, because this wasn't quite the calculation I wanted to do. Doesn't, I want to display the, uh, uh, the plateau. Okay, let's rerun it. Okay, nice. So, just in these few seconds, you see we started off with one walker, and we've actually got to uh, about 150,000 or so, which for this problem is, is the plateau. Now, it's a bit lower than uh, the plateau that I was showing before, which was at 210,000, and the reason is that we, we're using a certain spin symmetry uh, in this calculation that we weren't in the previous one, and that has the effect of lowering the plateau. But basically, if you plot this on a log scale, uh, you see you get super rapid growth, and now the uh, population is, uh, is stabilized at the plateau. Let's just update it. You can see now it's slow growth. Uh, um, now, what about the number of walkers on the reference determinant? That's now shown in green. Now you can see that until I hit the plateau, I didn't have many walkers on the reference determinant. One, two. But then when we go into the plateau, so this is now the, the population in the whole space is mysteriously not growing very quickly. But the population on my reference determinant is now racing up. That's kind of showing that you're getting an accumulation of walkers onto, uh, onto the uh, reference uh, determinant. Um, now, if we plot the energy, You can see wild oscillations to begin with, and then it settles down on some very well-defined value. Uh, and you can now plot, if we now put the exact energy on, 
which is uh, actually no, I think that might be the nitrogen molecule. That's another. Let me just find out what the uh, exact energy is. By the exact energy, I mean if you did an exact diagonalization. So you have this exact energy to, you know, more than six-figure accuracy. Uh, with any luck, they will be rather close to each other. Yeah, there you go. So you can see the, uh, this is our uh, oscillations uh, converging onto the, onto the exact result. Okay, now suppose we were to do the calculation, but we didn't allow the system to grow to the plateau. So I'm now going to reduce the number of walkers to 50,000. Or let's say, yeah, I've never done this calculation, by the way, so I'm kind of curious to see what, what will happen. Um, but let's now repeat the calculation. <clears throat> so now we will go into variable shift mode uh, at 50,000 walkers, and that happens to be below the plateau. Uh, so here you can see the number of walkers shot up, we went into variable shift mode, and actually we've now dropped below, uh, below uh, our 50,000 that we'd set. But this is the number of walkers that's on the Hartree-Fock determinant. Let's put it on a log scale. And it's essentially fluctuating between one, it probably gets to zero, and then it doesn't appear on this plot because there's a minus infinity and so on. So you can see that if I terminate, if I go into variable shift mode before we get to the plateau, we don't get a signal appearing on the Hartree-Fock uh, determinant. And um, if I then try to measure the energy, I'll probably get total nonsense. Let's just have a look. Yeah. I mean, look at this scale. I mean, ironically, it's actually for the mean may not be so bad, but I wouldn't rely much on that. I mean, the scale is absolutely huge. And so this is, this is the problem that basically I don't have any reasonable description of my wave function. So the message is that if you're running... Uh, with uh, FCI QMC, let's go back to our talk now, um, you've got to hit the plateau. But of course, the plateau may be at such a high number that you may not be able to get there. And then the problem is, well, how can you... Is it generally true that the Hartree-Fock determinant has no actually. Um, so it's usually, if there's any determinant that has a significant weight, is usually the Hartree fault. But of course, there are many problems in which there are other determinants that have comparable weight to the Hartree fault. And that's one, some, one of the things that we'll, we'll deal with later on. But the, anyway, the question is, how can we reduce the number of walkers while maintaining full CI accuracy? In other words, we want to be able to run walkers with you know, reasonable number of walkers and still end up with the exact solution. And this actually turns out uh, to involve one minor tweak to the algorithm that uh, uh, we call uh, survival of the fittest. And this is the initiator step. And it occurs immediately after uh, we've tried to spawn. And so this was actually 
so the, the way we came up with this idea, I had a graduate student, Deirdre Cleland, who really traced, if you like, trajectories of walkers over time. And, uh, and, uh, and then we realized that the damaging problem was whenever determinants, uh, so that occasionally it's, it's, let's say, occupied by a positive walker, and then it dies, and at some time it becomes occupied by a negative walker. So the signal emanating from that determinant would change sign. Because, of course, whenever uh, 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 the, um, a determinant changes sign, all the subsequent progeny also change sign. And that becomes, if you like, a so source of incoherent noise. And we wanted to cut that out. And the question was, how do you cut it out? And so what we say is, so we introduce two if statements into the algorithm. And um, so it introduces the concept of an initiator. So let's suppose here we're a parent determinant. And now we want to spawn on this determinant. Suppose we've selected that to spawn on. And we, uh, and, and we spawn a, a child here. So we've already decided we want to spawn a child here. Now we ask the two if statements. So the first if statement asks, is D currently empty or not? In other words, is there currently a walker on D or not? If there is a walker on D, then the algorithm proceeds as normal. We don't change anything. But if D is empty, so in other words, we are just about to bring to life a new determinant, we then ask how many walkers were on the parent. And we only allow that new child to survive if the parent determinant had a number of walkers that exceeded a critical number, typically three. Otherwise, you kill that new child. So in other words, determinants that instantaneously have three or more walkers on them are allowed to bring to life new determinants. Otherwise, uh, 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 you know, those children are, are killed. Whereas if, you, if you're not an initiator, so your amplitude is less than, let's say, three, then you can continue to spawn on the already occupied determinants, but you can't spawn uh, on, on new ones. And uh, actually, I'll, um, I'll, we'll do an online demonstration, so I, I'll skip that thing. So the first thing that, that arises is the question, well, OK, that's a nice rule you're introducing, but surely you're going to mess up your solution. And the interesting uh, point here is that our initiator method remains exact. And it remains exact in the limit of large, uh, in the large walker limit. So I have a guarantee that as I crank up my, uh, my number of walkers, I will, my algorithm will revert to being the original algorithm. The original algorithm we know is exact if you're above the, uh, if you're above the plateau. So therefore, we have this guarantee that in the large walker limit, the initiator algorithm uh, remains exact. And so what's the proof of that? The proof is that in the large walker limit, all determinants acquire an occupation. And so therefore, even if you're a non-initiator, the children that you're spawning will survive uh, uh, on those determinants. And uh, in other words, the first if statement, the survival of the fittest if statement, just doesn't, uh, just doesn't uh, arise. You pass the first if statement. And so therefore, the large walker limit of our initiator algorithm becomes the original algorithm. And because we know the large walker limit of the original algorithm is full CI, we have that the large walker limit of the initiator algorithm is uh, the full CI limit. Now, what's interesting is that whereas the original algorithm, before you get to the plateau, you cannot extract any noise, any meaningful information out of it. In this problem, it, it, with the initiator method, even with a very small number of walkers, you actually get a very, very precise solution. So this is an example. We can run this uh, in a second. 
of the nitrogen molecule with 540 million determinants in it. So this, the plateau, was at about 240 million walkers. So with the original algorithm, if I truncated the calculation before I got to the 240 million walker limit, I would get nonsense out of it. But instead, here, only with 10,000 walkers, first of all, I get a very reasonable energy. It's only a couple of millihartries off the exact one. And secondly, the error bar is nice and bounded. And then as I increase the number of walkers here to 100,000, uh, I'm really pretty close. And then by the time I get to a million walkers, I've essentially, I'm indistinguishable from the, uh, from the exact solution. So let's now run this um, uh, neon calculation. But now let's do the initiator method. So now I'm going to switch on the initiator keyword. It's frozen. So now we're going to keep to the same uh, 500,000, uh, sorry, 50,000 simulation that, that with the full method gave us nonsense. Okay. So if we now plot the number of walkers, So now you see we've gone, we've hit 50,000. We've now gone into variable shift mode. So we're stabilizing. And now you see here, that's already the population on the hartree fock determinant. So that is, if we go on to a log scale, probably about 5,000 walkers. So you see with the initiator method, we actually grow the population on this reference determinant. Uh, it essentially a similar rate to which we are growing the full population. Um, let's see. Network seems to have slowed down. It's frozen. Yeah, that's a pity. Let's see if I could fire it up again. Well, let's continue our talk. We'll come back to this. Uh, uh, we'll come back to this in a second. Okay. So one thing that one might ask is: uh, Is this algorithm sensitive to this critical uh, parameter? So we set it to be three um, as as defining the initiator th the threshold. Um, but in fact, the algorithm is remarkably insensitive to that parameter as well. So you can set it to be 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 10. And in all cases, you can see convergence uh, uh, in the large walker limit to, that, uh, to the exact value. So that's a, that's a good thing. You don't want algorithms that show excessive sensitivity to some of these uh, internal parameters. Um, let me see if... Uh, Connection has come back. No, it hasn't. Okay, well, let's hope it comes back. 
Okay. So, so how does this initiator method actually work? So this is uh, going back to the beryllium dimer again. We do now a simulation with 2,000 walkers. And in this problem, which the Hilbert space was about 350,000 walkers, the plateau was, if I recall, about 200,000 walkers in that, in that, re in that re re region. So now we're doing a, a simulation with many, many fewer walkers than, uh, than, than the value at the plateau. So here you start off the simulation, I think, with 10 walkers. And uh, we grow the population to 2,000. And then we, we stabilize the population. And in green, you have the number of determinants that are instantaneously occupied. So obviously, it's below 2,000. It's, I don't know, 1,900 in that order, 1,800 in that order. And of those instantaneously occupied determinants, in red, it's shown the number of initiators, so the number of determinants that actually have a population of more than three walkers. And that's shown in here. So there are about 80 or so initiators instantaneously. And the first thing to point out is that you can see this is a fluctuating number. So you can be an initiator at this time step because you've got four walkers. And if on the next time step you drop below four walkers to three, then you cease to be an initiator. So the initiator, the, the, the distribution of initiators is itself a strongly fluctuating uh, object. Okay, now, now the first thing that, that might appear, what this algorithm is doing, is just selecting the important determinants in the, in the, in the system. This might be a reasonable hypothesis as to how this method is working. And, um, but that's actually not what is happening. So if you take those initiated determinants, and then you just diagonalize the Hamiltonian in that space of, let's say, 80 determinants. So you, have a, you set up your 80 by 80 Hamiltonian and diagonalize it and get the lowest energy uh, eigenstate. You find that the energy of that uh, lowest energy eigenstate is way off the, the exact one. So the exact correlation energy in this problem is about 150 millihartries, whereas the correlation energy that is embodied only in these uh, 80 or so determinants is only one third of that. So uh, that's one thing. Now you can say, well, what happens if I take all 1,800 or so determinants and I diagonalize in the space of 1,800 determinants that I'm instantaneously occupying? Well, of course, it's a variational calculation, so therefore you'll gain a bit more correlation energy. That's shown in purple. But it's still only half the correlation energy of the problem. And yet, if you look at the projected energy that's shown in green, you can see that it's nicely oscillating about the exact value. So, in other words, the projective dynamics that we are doing is actually sampling the correct wave function, although the, instant, if the best instantaneous wave function is completely off. So that can be kind of shown here. So in blue is the exact wave function, and now we've actually reordered the, uh, the determinants so that the first set is the hartree fock and then the double excitations and so on. But it doesn't matter. So in blue, I show the exact amplitudes, and in green is an instantaneous snapshot that we get from our Monte Carlo. So this, I don't know if you can see it, this thing here, uh, which has got an amplitude of, in these units, two, is a determinant with two walkers on it. This one here has got minus one walkers on it, and so on. And so instantaneously, you have your walkers, and they're woo, kind of coarse grain description of our wave function, but nobody would say that our green is in any sense an accurate approximation of our blue. So instantaneously, our sampled wave function isn't very good. We've only got 2,000 walkers. But now, if we do something that we don't normally do in our simulation, but it's to histogram the space, so we introduce a, a vector that is now the length of the Hilbert space, 
And every time a walker enters it, we, for the time that it's living there, we keep a running average. And so we keep a running average, uh, the time average, our distribution. So that, as I say, is something we don't do usually because it, it would essentially obviate the whole, uh, whole method. But then if you actually time average our populations, this is what you get. It's a staggeringly good representation of the exact wave function. So you can see, you know, the fine details of the original wave function have now been resolved. And so, so I come back to this, that the, the, the way this method works is by generating many distributions of walkers, which on average give you the exact solution, not instantaneously. Okay, let's see. Let's see if the uh, we can get. Okay, ah, we got it. Okay, so let's plot. So this is the calculation that we did with uh, fifty thousand walkers, um, and there you go. So you see, this is the exact solution, and now this is our, in our initiator method, and you could continue this simulation for as long as you like, and you will get a completely stable. Uh, signal oscillating about about the uh, about the exact uh, number. So that's with fifty thousand walkers. Um, let's now do a calculation with five hundred walkers. So I'm now going to do a calculation with five hundred walkers. Let's see what happens now. Again, I haven't done this calculation before. So now this is a really gross undersampling of this Hilbert space. By the way, the Hilbert space in this problem is about 6.6 um, uh, 6 million determinants, 6.7 million determinants. Whoops. Yeah. So now we've only got 500 walkers in the whole space, about 100 walkers on the, uh, on the Hartree-Fock determinant. Again, it's stable. This is the crucial thing. It's showing fluctuations, but it's stable. And um, if I now plot the energy, let's see where the energy is. There you go. Again, uh, we're getting oscillations uh, now quite large. Not surprising. So this, by the way, is about 50 millihartries. So we've got oscillations about 50 millihartries, but stably about, uh, about the solution. We're not getting... Uh, so the usual problem with fermion Monte Carlo is the longer you oscillate, the wilder become. Sorry, the longer you simulate, the wilder become the, uh, the long time fluctuations until you cannot extract any signal uh, from this. So that is the... Uh, and actually, you can take this down to really tiny numbers of walkers. And as long as the Hartree-Fock determinant has a well-defined sign, you find that you get a well-defined uh, solution. So that is the initiator method. Um, and now... You can ask, well, okay, well, that's very well and nice, but what ultimately is the scaling of the algorithm? So this is actually quite an old calculation that we did on uh, a set of atoms and anions. Uh, and anions are really very strongly correlated uh, beasts. They're difficult to describe. And so we did these calculations on, uh, I think, basically from lithium across the first row and then to sodium. And... Uh, the, along this axis is the, is the size of the Hilbert space that we actually spanned for those set from roughly 1,000 to 10 to the 16 uh, in this case. And on this axis, we show the number of walkers that we needed to converge the calculation. And our rule of thumb when we do our calculations is we, we, we uh, put in enough walkers so that we get 50,000 walkers on the Hartree-Fock determinant. That's our rule of thumb. And uh, so why, why 50,000? 
And the answer is that you can show that the fluctuation in the number of walkers basically follows a, a square root law. So that if you've got 100 walkers on any given determinant, then the fluctuations on that determinant will be on the order of 10. If you have 10,000 walkers, then the fluctuations on that determinant will be on the order of 100, which is 1% relative. And at 50,000, you're, uh, you're below the 1%, uh, you're below the 1% uh, limit. And so this is the number of walkers you need in order to end up with 50,000 uh, walkers on the, uh, the Hartree-Fock uh, determinant. And the point is that you can see that as you go up from about 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 16 determinants, actually the number of walkers that we needed goes up from about 50,000, well, that was the minimum we needed because that was the criterion that we set, through to about 10 million walkers. So with only 10 million walkers in this case, we were able to very, very accurately resolve uh, these systems that had 10 to the 16 uh, stated determinants in them. And um, so uh, you can then actually fit so the, uh, a uh, straight line through this log-log plot, and uh, you get this exponent. So the slope of this line turns out to be about 0.16. So in other words, the method remains exponential scaling, but so because it goes as NFCI, which is itself exponential, but to a small exponent. Um, these points here, by the way, refer to the original, uh, what we call the full method, without initiators. And actually, the slopes uh, here are, um, is it has a slope 1. So the original algorithm has the same scaling as exact diagonalization, only a smaller prefactor. But the initiator method reduces the exponent of the exponential scaling. And we don't really have a theory for this uh, 0.16, by the way. It turns out to be fairly uniform, although there are difficult systems in which the, uh, that number actually goes up. So if you're dealing with a Hubbard model, for example, in a difficult U regime, the exponent is, unfortunately, we think, close to 1. But for many molecular systems, at least, uh, it turns out to be uh, quite small. So um, the thing is that the set of initiators is dynamic and self-selecting. So from the perspective of the user, you don't have to make any choice of what's going to be an initiator and what's not. And that's a very nice feature of the algorithm. It basically does the selection itself. And so the method really is a black box method. No knowledge of the wave function is assumed. And the key parameter is the number of walkers. So you have to go on increasing the number of walkers until your energy basically ceases to vary. That's the, uh, that's the thing. And so we usually aim for enough walkers so that you've accumulated about 50,000 on the Hartree-Fock determinant. This is a fairly conservative criterion. You usually get to convergence well before that. Although there will again be systems where this is uh, actually not sufficient at the same time. We're also aware of those systems. So. But for most systems, if you can run enough walkers so that about 50,000 end up on the Hartree-Fock determinant, then um, uh, you're, you're OK. Um, now, the CPU time is proportional to the walker number. And that's actually a non-trivial statement. Because if you implement the algorithm in a naive way, you would think the annihilation step actually would scale quadratically with the number of walkers. So you know, for every given walker, you have to search through all the other walkers to find out if there's anything that's coincident on it. And so that's the naive implementation of annihilation. And that would obviously scale quadratically. It turns out that uh, there are very nice uh, either using sorting algorithms or better still hash algorithms that we can actually use in practice now in which you can, uh, in order n steps instead of order n squared steps, determine how many walkers are coincident on any given uh, determinant. And so that, that makes the CPU time proportional to walker number. Um, on the downside, 
So what's the downside of the algorithm? And the main downside is that I cannot a priori tell you how long it would take or what CPU resources you would need to solve a specific problem. So, you know, if you do normal many-body theory, uh, apart from the number of iterations you might need to converge a problem, they're fairly well, you know, you can work out more or less beforehand how much uh, time you're going to need to solve a problem. Here you cannot do it because I cannot tell you how many walkers you would need in practice to solve a problem. So this means that there is some amount of experimentation that's, uh, that's involved. Uh, but, uh, but in practice, I mean, we do calculations at uh, 200 million walkers. Actually, that's an old slide. We could go on to well beyond that now, even a billion walkers. And that's perfectly feasible. You need more than a quad core to do it. But uh, you can do it on a machine with a few hundred, uh, few hundred processors. Actually, ironically, the, the, the biggest bottleneck that we have with our calculation right now, with our method right now, is the input-output of actually dumping the information of, of, of our distribution of walkers onto disk and then reading it back in for a subsequent calculation. That can take hours of time, actually, uh, when you're generating gigabytes worth of, uh, worth of I.O. on a parallel machine. Okay. Uh, it's, nice and, it's a nice and parallel uh, algorithm, um, although with some of the tweaks that I'll be talking about, the, it's, the more sophisticated versions uh, don't parallelize quite as well, but nevertheless, we can typically parallelize quite successfully to several thousand cores before you, uh, before you uh, begin to uh, move off, um, to move off uh, the ideal uh, scaling. So that's a nice feature. Again, with most sort of, you know, sophisticated uh, quantum chemical algorithms, couple cluster and so on, it's very hard to get parallelism out at a thousand or several thousand uh, uh, processor level. Okay, um, so let me see how far we've got. Uh, 11.30. How much time do we have? Half an hour or so. Okay. So then I'm going to now talk a little bit about um, some some more technicalities uh, um, uh, of of the algorithm. And the first thing is that uh, what we actually store when we're talking about a determinant is we store uh, binary strings. So uh, so a given determinant you can think of as a list of ones and zeros determining what is uh, occupied and what's unoccupied. And the nice thing about this binary representation is that, of course, uh, there is a sort of a unique and invertible map that takes you from your binary string onto a given integer. So, uh, so you have a list of these ni's, which is ones and zeros, and uh, there is a... Uh, uh, an, an integer associated with that. So that is, uh, if you like, a label. Or given this capital I label or index, I can work out by inverting the map which orbitals are occupied and unoccupied. And that's, uh, that's something that can be done very efficiently. So this, at the, at the heart of our uh, algorithm is this is going backwards and forwards between this. So, so when I have a list of determinants, I have a list of these I's, but for a, a, a capital I's, but any given capital I, I can easily decode and get the, uh, in, the occupied orbitals in that uh, determinant. So the first thing is that this gives us uh, compact storage. So if I have a system with 2M spin orbitals, then the number of uh, integers I need, let's say 64-bit integers I need to encode the information is uh, this, uh, is the ceiling of 2m over 64. So if I have a problem with 200 spin orbitals, then essentially four integers, four 64-bit integers, is sufficient for me to encode the information about any determinant I like, irrespective of the number of electrons in the system. So that's compact storage, uh, which is uh, one thing. Now, the other thing is that uh, a random list, uh, a random selection of determinants can always be uniquely ordered. And in fact, uh, in, 
the version before the, the one that we actually currently are on, we would always maintain a, an ordered list of determinants. So every time I spawned a new walker, and I wanted to add it to the, to the list of uh, currently occupied walkers, I would scan the list and I would insert that determinant in the appropriate, uh, at the appropriate point. So there is a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, shuffling of memory. But the crucial point about keeping these ordered lists is that it makes the subsequent searching exceedingly efficient because you can use search ordered lists you know, in log, in log uh, time. And this is crucial for the annihilation step. So every time I spawn a walker, and I don't know if that determinant is, is, is occupied or not, I can easily search within our list of gigantic list of, I don't know, 100 million walkers, I can easily find if there is a, uh, if there is a walker there. As I say, nowadays we actually use the hash algorithms to do that. So it means you, it, it basically obviates a binary search of a long list. But, you know, there's, those are their, their, their fairly analogous uh, algorithms. Um, so two further uh, uh, uses of our bit string uh, representation is that our excitation generation is is extremely efficient. So given a bit string, I know which bits are ones and which bits are zeros. So when I come to do an excitation, I can select a pair of electrons and a pair of holes with extreme rapidity. In fact, we can do this essentially this process, this fundamental process, in about ten to the eight of these per second per core. That's how rapid this uh, process of excitation uh, generation is. And so that's how you know, we can do these, these super fast calculations uh, involving many, many, uh, many walkers. But the other is uh, parallelization, where we use, where we used hash functions uh, uh, before. So essentially, given uh, the index of our, uh, of our determinant, uh, which can be several integers, by the way. But anyway, let's say four or five in uh, integers. You put it into a hash algorithm, and what the hash algorithm does is basically return you a random number distributed between 0 and 1, but it's a deterministic random number. So for the same input, I always get the same output, which is, uh, which is what you need. So then uh, I can take this, modulo the number of processors I've got, to distribute our walkers among the processors. So that's so in a parallelization scheme, that's actually very important, that every time a walker is spawned on a given determinant, it's deterministically sent always to the same processor. And then the annihilation is, uh, is locally done on that processor. So what you don't want to have uh, two walkers on the same determinant but on different processes because that would then make the annihilation uh, very difficult. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what we store is, 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 is a ordered list of instantaneously occupied determinants together with a number of signed walkers on each determinant. So now here we kind of move a little bit away from a strict walker representation. So for each determinant, we actually store the number of walkers on that determinant, rather than just having a distributed list only of walkers. So we ha here we have an ordered list, and we have over here, n of i1 is the number of walkers, sign number of walkers on determinant i1. n of i2, sign number of walkers on uh, i2, and so on. So that is... Uh, if you like, uh, what is uh, uh, instantaneously stored in our uh, in our um, uh, uh, in our main memory list, and so what happens is that we run over our list of parent determinants, and for each parent determinant, we loop over the number of walkers on the parent determinant, and it attempts to uh, uh, and so each one of these typically makes multiple attempts at spawning walkers, multiple if there are multiple walkers on it. And we get a new list uh, of, uh, of, of newly spawned walkers, which, uh, again, once again, we sort. And then, for each one of these, 
uh, so we, we now loop over this J list and we update our I list, so to speak, with the number of walkers that we have, uh, that we have um, uh, introduced by, uh, through the uh, spawning event. And so this basically takes care of the annihilation step. So for example, if there was a positive walker here, so this was one, and this happened to be minus one, then, uh, then those two would annihilate each other, and this would become zero. And it's crucial that whenever a given determinant acquires zero occupancy, it's then deleted from the list of instantaneously occupied uh, determinants. That's a crucial po point of this algorithm, because otherwise you end up with longer and longer, longer lists with, uh, with no occupancy in them. So that this step, if you like, uh, keeps the number of um, uh, keeps the number of uh, instantaneously occupied determinants uh, small. Now, if it happens that one of these j's is not present in this list, then that means that we are about to introduce a new uh, determinant into our list, and then we would locate its position and insert it in there. Uh, subject to the uh, cri uh, initiator criterion. Okay, so merging and annihilation basically takes uh, ns log nd uh, uh, steps. So number of spawns, and this is log nd is the number of uh, determinants that are instantaneously held. So this process actually only takes a few percent of the overall CPU time. That's very important to so because the you know again naively speaking, one would think that the annihilation it becomes a bottleneck in the algorithm, but in practice, it's uh, it's a really minor component uh, of the overall uh, of the overall cost. Okay, um, so. Let me just show you some, some examples. These are from electron affinities. Uh, so you calculate the energy of the atom, and you calculate the energy of the anion. You subtract the two, and that gives you the electron affinity. Um, and so here you see we're doing it as a function of these basis sets, augmented uh, 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 basis sets, um, going from double zeta through to quintuple zeta. So this is basically, this just shows you here the size of the basis set. So x is the, is the cardinal number. It basically tells you the highest angular mom, uh, momentum component. And it basically goes as x cubed, if I'm not mistaken. If you multiply this out, you get x cubed. So when we talk about augmented VDZ, we're talking about 23 orbitals per atom first row. When we're dealing with augmented VTZ, we're dealing with 46. Augmented VQZ, we're dealing with 80, and so on. So what's shown here is the basis set. So we're really going to very large basis sets and the corresponding electron affinities. And the good thing about electron affinities uh, is that then they've been measured to very, very high accuracy. So this is experiment where there's no doubt about the experiment, in other words. And uh, also, the non-relativistic limit is probably good for these, uh, for these atoms. But the point to see is that we converge from below. Um, the experimental value is here. And this dotted line on either side is what the chemists call chemical accuracy is 1 kcal per mole. So that's the, that's the ideal accuracy you try to aim for. Uh, you try to uh, uh, aim for. You would try to be within these... Uh, within these brackets. And so you can see uh, convergences towards experiment. It's very interesting. Sodium, for example, sodium anion is not a beast that you would normally come with because you'd normally ionize a sodium rather than put an electron in sodium. So you have this outer electron, which is, which is very loosely bound. But you can see the extraordinary accuracy with which, uh, with which you, know, you, you can actually calculate this. Uh, the biggest calculation in this, in this plot here is, is the fluorine anion, which has got 10 electrons, in this V5Z, which has got 127 uh, orbitals. And that, so that's got a Hilbert space of 4 by 10 to the 15. And we needed about 8 million walkers to, uh, to sample that problem. In other words, to get 50,000 walkers 
on, on, the, um, on the Hartree fault. And so that is instantaneously, if you like, the fraction of the Hilbert space that's being instantaneously occupied is about a few in a billion. So that's how sparse is the, is, is the, is the vector that we're actually sampling. Uh, but it's, it gives you uh, stable uh, solutions. So this is uh, uh, another example. Now these are, these are more complicated. C2 molecule up to F2 molecule in these basis sets. And th so these have got 108 spatial orbitals or 216 uh, spin orbitals running from about 8 electrons to 14 electrons. And the Hilbert space has now run from about 10 to the 11 through to 10 to the 19. Uh, so, and these are the numbers of walkers you actually need to converge these calculations. They run from a couple of million to about 100 million or so in the case of NO. Um, now, this is, there's really interesting things about this. One of them, you can see, for example, the CO molecule, we needed about 60 million walkers to converge. Uh, and the fluorine molecule, we needed about 50 million walkers uh, to converge. But the F2 molecule has got, the Hilbert space is five orders of magnitude larger uh, than the CO molecule, 10 to the 19 as opposed to 10 to the 14. So why do we need more walkers in the case of the CO molecule? And that's because intrinsically the wave function of the CO molecule turns out to be more complicated, more multi-reference, less dominated, by the Hartree-Fock determinant compared to the F2 molecule. And that's kind of interesting that the algorithm senses the complexity of the wave function and then tells you, OK, I'm going to need more walkers uh, to get to convergence. And that's the kind of sort of intangible thing that you, know, you or I, or essentially no one else, has, has enough insight uh, into, these, into these wave functions to be able to really talk about uh, the complexity of them. But the algorithm itself is, uh, is sensitive uh, to that. And that's a very nice thing about it. Um, I don't know if we want to go through numbers, but this, this plot is kind of interesting. It shows a similar thing, similar trend to the electron affinities. Um, uh, again, these are the dissociation energies, so the energy that you need to, uh, to, to fully dissociate a molecule. Um, so to do these calculations, you do one calculation of the molecule at its equilibrium geometry, and then one or possibly two calculations of the isolated atoms. Um, you do two if they're, if they're uh, these heteronuclear things. And then you subtract the, the molecule uh, from the sum of the two atoms. And again, um, as you increase your basis set, you can see you approach uh, the experimental numbers. But now you can see chemical accuracy, which is 1 kcal per mole, is on a finer scale compared to uh, the results that we're getting. Um, so even when you're dealing with these quadruple zeta uh, calculations, so you know, in the case of CO, in principle, that's a wave function that's, got, that's been expanded at 10 to the 14 functions. But that's still uh, a couple of kcals away from experimental values. In other words, you haven't hit the land of milk and honey, which is chemical accuracy. So it's, it's sort of kind of telling you just how difficult it is to achieve chemical accuracy uh, for these systems. But this slow convergence of, the base of, uh, of these results is actually not so much a correlation problem at the full CI level, but is, uh, is a manifestation of that Coulomb cusp problem that you need to get to larger and larger basis sets to be able to describe uh, the Coulomb cusp. So typically in this cusp, in this region, from a chemical perspective, there may be a couple of kcals of uh, correlation energy, differential correlation energy buried there. In other words, if you do the same calculation on the atom and the molecule, you'll, you'll incur an error of about 2 kcals per mole because of this uh, not capturing this region, this, this short distance region. And that is the error that is being, uh, that is being seen here. 
which I'm afraid is pretty depressing news because uh, that's, uh, you know, you do a huge amount of work and you're sure that you're going to hit this land of milk and honey and actually you don't. You're uh, short of it. And you're actually short of it in nearly, oh, apart from the beryllium dimer, we, which we were within it. But anyway, that's a small system. <clears throat> so what are we going to do in order to, uh, in order to uh, accelerate basis set convergence? And there are basically two techniques, and they're both approximate. And they involve either using extrapolations from earlier basis sets so uh, that you can show that the correlation energy um, typically scales, or the, or, the, or the error in the correlation energy scales as 1 over x cubed, third power of the uh, basis set. And that's a pretty general result, actually. It's essentially to do with the way you're filling space. So, so when we're doing these TQ extrapolations, we're essentially taking the correlation energies uh, uh, that you get from the triple zeta and from the quadruple zeta, and then assuming this kind of an x cubed law, extrapolating to the infinite correlation, uh, uh, to the infinite basis set limit, and then using those correlation energies to compute the dissociation energies. And that's the value that you get uh, for these dissociation energies. They're actually, that actually brings you within uh, chemical accuracy, which is a nice thing. So um, in, in a way, it's a confirmation, if you like, that, uh, that the basis set error is, um, is, uh, is, is, is the underlying source of problem here. And the other thing which is a different technique, is uh, what we call F12. And that introduces, uh, what, what it does, and I'll talk a little bit about it tomorrow maybe, is to treat the absence of a cusp as a perturbative correction. In other words, knowing the behavior of the wave function as two electrons come close to each other but are still somewhat distant, you can then discrete, get an energy functional that, uh, well, if you like, you can extend this wave function down to the cusp, which is obviously an approximation at that point, and work out in a perturbative manner what that would mean for the correlation energy. And that's what these F12 uh, corrections are. Um, now, the good thing about the F12 corrections is that they're one-shot corrections. So for a given basis set, you can correct that number to get a certain value, whereas the extrapolations obviously require two, two calculations. And, um, but anyway, in both cases, we now end up with a satisfactory uh, uh, description um, of, the, uh, of these dissociation energies. But this is the kind of thing that when you come to do uh, quantum chemistry, at least, you have to start, uh, you know, there is a lot of after you do these calculations, there's some amount of uh, work that you have to do uh, if, if you like to polish things off, so to speak. But it's uh, somewhat tangential to the, uh, to the to the to at least the purposes of these lectures. Okay, I will. Uh, um, okay, so how much how much time? Five, five, ten minutes? Okay. So let, let me just uh, finish off by uh, looking at some of the structures of these wave functions that we get. Um, so what we've done is for a, a given molecule, let's say, I don't know, let's take N2, for example, is um, we've ordered the, the determinants in terms of in descending order of population. So we have the leading determinant, say that's, we call that determinant one. The second most uh, populated determinant, we call that uh, determinant two, and so on. And uh, for, so for descending uh, order, we plot the corresponding populations. So uh, here you can see the leading determinant has got uh, 50,000 uh, walkers on it, because that is the criteria that we used to, uh, to uh, 
uh, in our calculations. And, um, and the, these are both on a log-log scale. So when you get to the tenth most important determinant, you end up with a lower population. So what I show here are two different geometries, let's say for the C2 molecule, one in which the C2 molecule is at equilibrium geometry, and one in which the C2 molecule has been stretched. In this case, the five times the, uh, the, uh, the geometry. And the, and the feature that, that makes these uh, problems difficult is that as you begin to stretch uh, and you start to break these bonds, covalent bonds, the corresponding correlation problem becomes harder and harder and harder. And the way that manifests itself is that you get determinants other than the Hartree-Fock determinant whose importance grows in, uh, in, in, in magnitude. And you see that very clearly. So, for example, if you're dealing with the N2 molecule and at equilibrium geometry, you see you have the leading determinant that's got 50,000 walkers on it. And the next determinant, which is this one, has got under 10,000 walkers. And it's still pretty heavily populated, but it's got under 10,000. And then, as, as, you, as you go to the less and less important determinants, you come down, 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 until let's say the 100,000th most important determinant has about the initiator threshold of about three walkers on it. So this, is, so this distribution here is telling you about the rate of decay in the Hilbert space of important determinants. So in this problem, uh, uh, you would have something like 100,000 determinants that are definitely important. Now look what happens when you stretch the molecule. Um, when you stretch it, you end up with a whole series, I think, of roughly 30 determinants, which all end up to be equally important compared to the Hartree-Fock. So they've all got, in this case, about 50,000 uh, 50, determinants in them. And then you get another series that has got another shell, and then you get this precipitous jump down here, and it, and it decays off. Uh, you typically end up with uh, roughly uh, the same number, maybe within a factor of 10 or so, uh, of important determinants. But the crucial point is that the algorithm somehow sorts out what is important and what's not important and uh, distributes walkers um, <coughs> uh, accordingly. Now, there's a very interesting effect that you notice that in the... These are the hetero atoms, NO, CN, and CO, and these ones are the homonuclear molecules. You notice that in the, in the case of the heteronuclear atoms, actually the stretched limit gets easier rather than more difficult. So if you take CN, initially you end up with, with a more highly populated determinants. So it's a more multi-reference problem. But the decay in the Hilbert space is actually faster compared to the heteronuclear case. So that's a very interesting thing, that as you stretch out these two atoms, if they're different, this atom basically develops its own Hilbert space, and this atom develops its own Hilbert space, and, and, and the determinants essentially don't talk to each other, apart from the low-energy ones. But that effect is not seen when you... Uh, when, you, um, uh, when you're if dealing with the homonuclear atoms, where in the worst-case scenario with N2, you can see substantially more uh, required, a factor of 10. In the case of C2, again, you start off being more multi-configurational among the important determinants, but you end up more or less with roughly the same number of, uh, same number of uh, important uh, determinants. Okay. I think I'll probably stop there, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll take your questions. <clears throat>